kind of appropriate for what we're talking about this morning. And it goes, Talith on the mountain, and whoops, where's the picture? My picture of a mountain here. Why are there mountains? My picture of a mountain here. Why are there mountains? Why are there mountains still here? Mountains are a problem for evolutionists. Why? Well, a guy named James Hutton, a Scottish doctor, physician, back in the 1700s, suggested that the earth was extremely old. Shortly after that, a guy named Charles Lyell, who was a geologist, cooked up his very famous and now foundational theory of uniformitarianism that the rate that things were happening in the past is the rate that things are happening now. Uniformity, very, very important. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is the erosion of the earth. That's the problem, the erosion rate of the earth. The average height reduction for all the continents of the world according to this article here, is about 2.4 inches per thousand years. Well, you say, well, that's pretty small erosion. Well, yes, it is. It's a very small erosion unless the Earth is 4.5 billion years old or 2.5. Actually, as Dr. Kent Hovind mentioned in the video downstairs, the, the current teaching is that the, the, the Big Bang happened about four and a half billion, no, I guess 18 billion years ago, and the Earth started to form about four and a half billion years ago. Well, the age of the continents apparently is assumed to be, and I'm not familiar with this because I'm not an evolutionist, approximately two and a half billion years old. That's what a standard geologists believe that the continents are, two and a half billion years old. Well, do the math. Even if you attend a, a a local high school, <clears throat> you can do that math. You multiply 2.4 times uh, 2.5 billion divided by 1,000, and it comes up to, by the way, 93 miles of erosion. Should be flat. Should be absolutely, totally flat. There should be no mountains left in two and a half billion years at the erosion rate today. Now remember, Charles Lyell, who founded the theory of uniformitarianism, and it's the basis of today's geology that rates now are the same as rates then, means that there should be no mountains left. Now you remember what Dr. Hovind said downstairs? It's pretty awesome. He quoted Hitler, and Hitler, who apparently was a master psychologist, said if you repeat a lie often enough, people believe it. Repeat a, loud, a lie often enough and loudly enough and people believe it. And then Dr. Hovind showed us in the video we have uh, first grade books. The earth is four and a half billion years old. Second grade books. The earth is four and a half billion years old. Third grade books. The earth is four and a half billion. You get the picture? Over and over and over this lie is repeated. Now, wh what are some of the, the solutions they've come up with? It's interesting. There's some interesting solutions that scientists have attempted to come up with to explain this. Perhaps the mountains still exist because uplift is constantly replacing them from below. And this comes from Scientific American, New Scientist Magazine, rather. Constantly being replaced from below. Well, there's a problem with that. If that was happening, then all of the sediment you view would be young sediment. Unfortunately, by their own dating methods, the mountains contain some very old sediments. So that's no good. That doesn't work. Nope. Try again. Okay. Number two. Perhaps the erosion rates now are abnormally high compared to two billion years ago. Whoa, whoa, what about Charles Lyell? Well, yes, but uh, humankind has affected the erosion rates. So the just uh, clear cutting, et cetera, et cetera. So they did calculations on this, and okay, we've doubled the erosion rates. Unfortunately, you need 300 to 500 times the erosion rate to, to answer the problem. So that doesn't work. Nope, try again. Uh, the climates in the past were much drier. That's another solution. Oh, wait a minute. We happen to know for a fact that the climates in the past were not drier. 
I have a picture of a seashell fossil on the top edge of the Grand Canyon with my finger pointing at it. That's a lot of water if it's going to go up that high. Of course, I believe that the Grand Canyon wasn't 7,000 feet high back then, the upper rim. But no, everybody pretty much agrees that that's not going to work because the climates of the past were wetter. What's the answer? What's the answer? God created. In the beginning, God created. The Earth is not two and a half billion years old. It's not four and a half billion years old. The solar system is not 18 billion years old. God created. And I'm not going to give you a specific time, but somewhere between probably 10,000 and 20,000 years is how long we've been here. God created in the beginning. And that's the solution. The erosion rates you're seeing now probably are pretty accurate that we're measuring now, and they probably were pretty uniform, but it doesn't go back because God created. Very, very, very important difference in outlook. As Dr. Ken Hovind says, there are only two possible outlooks. Right? God created or God didn't. You are either here as the result of a creation or you're here as the result of an accident. And if you hear the same lie over and over and over again long enough, you'll start to believe it. Why are there continents still here? And by the way, you aren't going to see this talked about in a standard classroom. You won't see this mentioned. There are a lot of things that are embarrassing. We, we run across uh, many, many things. Next week, I'm going to have another one from a physicist that, that, that just inexplicable. They're explicable to us because God created. We stand on the book called the Bible from cover to cover, from first word to last word, 100% the perfect word of God. Genesis, by the way, chapter 11, uh, 7, uh, verse 11, gives you the answer. The mountains were formed during the flood. And that's why that the earth is not flat now, because they weren't formed two and a half billion years ago. Thank you. and saw me walking across the yard. She said, who's that? And the guy said, I don't know. Maybe it's Carl Dunbar. Because <laughs> Carl's always dressed up and I happen to be dressed up this morning. Change. Change is what evolution is all about. And we have a video downstairs from Ken Hope. It's pretty fascinating. And he has an interesting comment. I do this a lot. And he says, if you kiss a frog and it turns into a prince quickly or instantly, it's a fairy tale. But if you kiss the frog, right, and it turns into a princess, I should say, because I have a picture of a princess, over millions of years, it's science? It's science? The whole foundation of, evolu of, of evolution is about change, right? That nothing somehow exploded, became a rock, became a frog, became a princess all by itself. Well, there are problems. One of the problems that evolutionists struggle with is the problem of living fossils. And in New Scientist magazine, which you can pick up at the University of New England, well, I actually don't take it. It's in the library. You have to put it back. But you can go read it there. Living fossils are a conundrum an unsolvable problem, you see, because as you went from an amoeba to a person, the reason the amoeba decided to become a person over a long period of time with a whole bunch of steps is because it was beneficial to do so. It's called the survival of the fittest. Well, then why, the conundrum, by the way, is an unsolvable problem, why are there fossils that are still alive? One of the most famous is the coelacanth, the fish that's 340 million years old, and somebody caught one off the coast of Africa just a short time ago. Well, here's some maybes, all reported in this New Scientist article, again, which you can read at UNE. Maybe chance and luck are the answer to evolutionary change. But that's not very scientific, and, and honestly, most evolutionary scientists reject that. It's not scientific at all. Maybe the key to success 
is to be able to live anywhere and be abundant. Cockroaches, for example, are everywhere. They're in the northeast, they're in the south. The first time I saw a cockroach, I was in Charleston Naval Shipyard in the, in the officer's quarters watching television with one. I looked down and the little fellow was, little fellow, you could saddle this guy and ride him, but he was sitting on the floor, he was watching the TV with me in the, in the officer's quarters at Charleston Naval Shipyard. They've been around for millions and millions of years, and maybe that's the key to success, but the coelacanth didn't live everywhere, like cockroaches live. Coelacanth, a very specialized fish, lives in a very particular area, so that argument doesn't work. Maybe, as the article suggests, the habitat has not changed. Well, but that applies to many other species, both living and dead. Habitat has changed, and they're still here. Or they're gone. Maybe the slow, as they put it, slow generation time, for example, a lizard, the, the Tatara lizard is supposed to be a living fossil, at 15 years. Maybe the slow generation time has slowed the evolutionary process down, so that's why living fossils are still here. But cockroaches are living fossils, and their reproduction time, generation time, is in days, not years. The interesting that one paleontologist is quoted as saying, a Yale paleontologist, organisms are so complex, it is hard to imagine any change happening without wrecking everything else. Well, I agree. All creation scientists agree. Exactly so. It's hard to imagine any change happening by itself without wrecking anything else. So why do evolutionists hold on to this? <coughs> Ken, Dr. Ken Hovind's video that we watched today on the age of the Earth is awesome. Absolutely awesome. He builds on this precept that if you keep lying long enough and loud enough, people believe you. Why? Well, here's a guy, his name is Dr. Lewontin, and he's an evolutionist, a materialist, and he says, no matter how counterintuitive, that means no matter how stupid, okay, that, that's what that means, counterintuitive, no matter how dumb, no matter how mystifying, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That's not science, that's philosophy. Evolution should be taught, as Dr. Hovind says, in, evolu in, in philosophy books, not in science books. That's ludicrous for a scientist to make a statement like that. That's not an honest search for truth, which is what science is all about. It's about reality. My question then is, why should you and I, as scientists, allow a demonic foot in the door? The Bible is clear. God created. There is no logical way for change, macroevolution to happen, that is, frog to princess. Microevolution is different, we understand that. Creationists invented it. From frog to princess without destroying everything else. The Bible makes it very clear that God created after its kind, and the kind has reproduced after its kind from the beginning. Thank you. in the bottle, the message of the bottle. There's a book written, maybe even a movie, I'm not sure. There's a, there's a book written anyway called The Message in the Bottle. Well, here's a picture of a bottle. And I'll walk up the aisle so you can see it. The bottle is encased in rock. Well, this picture happens to be in a museum in South Africa. You know, it's funny. I lived most of my life, and I only heard about South Africa one time. I had a professor at RPI in physics from South Africa, born and raised in South Africa. Now I'm running into South Africa all over the place. <laughs> but this particular bottle, it's in a museum. It's considered a curiosity. It's considered amazing. Why? Because the bottle is encased in rock. It happens that the bottle was on board the HMS, let's see, if I get the name right, Birkenhead. HMS, of course, stands for Her Majesty's Ship, or His Majesty's Ship, whichever one happens to be there, him or her, which sank about 130 years ago. Well, in 130 years, that's quite a long time, but it's not enough time in the brainwashing 
of evolution, if you will, for rock to form around the bottle. So therefore, this rock with a bottle inside of it is in a museum in South Africa as a really strange thing. It's unusual because the rock formed too quickly. But why is this considered unusual? It's because you and I have been brainwashed that millions and millions and millions and millions of years is required for anything to happen. Hmm? And that's automatic now. Whenever you see something that looks like it is rock, or like the Grand Canyon with the layers, turns out you can make layers in, in sedimentary rock overnight. And that's also seen in Australia or any place. That you can run water through sand and you'll see the layers build up. But you're automatically attuned to think that it's millions and millions and millions of years. It's brainwashing. We think that stalagmites and stalactites form very slowly. I toured Mammoth Cave down in Kentucky with my wife and Jeremy and, and Lori. And we're listening to the guy give this talk. He said, 500 million years it took for this stalactite here to form because it forms at such a slow rate. Well, then I was driving through Virginia and I saw stalactites. I get them mixed up. Which is the one that goes down? Stalactite, stalagmite. One goes up, one comes down. I don't know. Stalactite goes down. Thank you. Underneath this bridge in Virginia, there's a stalactite. You know, doing the calculation for of, of, of thousands of an inch a year, that bridge in Virginia has been there for 150,000 years. Well, I don't think so. I don't think Virginia's been there that long, and I don't think those bridges have been there that long. I took a photograph of it. You're preconditioned to think that things take a long time to happen. So every once in a while, the Lord shows us something that opens our eyes maybe just a little bit doesn't take as much time as you think. Rocks form very quickly. Fossils can form very quickly. Uh, it does not take millions. Of, coal forms very quickly. In fact, we have a video downstairs of a scientist who made coal in five days. using it. Rock formation, coal formation, that type of thing it has much more to do with pressure and temperature than it does with time. But you're not told that. You're not taught that by evolutionists. You're taught that it takes millions and millions of years for a rock to form. So whenever something like this happens, where a bottle from the Birkenhead, for example, 130 years old, is found encased in rock, it's considered a museum-worthy curiosity because it is so unusual. What's unusual about it is because you've been brainwashed, I've been brainwashed, to believe that any kind of rock formation takes millions and millions and millions of years. It doesn't. It only takes a short time. It's a matter of condition, of chemical condition, not a matter of time. Thank you. Stone Age people, are you smarter than Stone Age people? Are you more intelligent than they are? See, that's the basic presupposition. Isn't it? When you go back to the, the real theory of evolution, and nobody ever goes back this far. The theory of evolution is a rock became a frog. I call this Freddy, my, my favorite little frog, Fred. And Freddy evolved into a princess. Oops, I don't want to cover the princess up. To get from a frog, which isn't very smart, See, frogs aren't too bright. They just kind of sit around on lily pads and eat bugs, right? And princesses are pretty smart indeed because they can figure out all kinds of things. She represents us. But in the process to go from here, an amphibian, to here, which happened by chance, with no designing influence, that's the theory of evolution. And I keep going back over that, over and I will, and over, because the world doesn't present it that way. The world tries to get you hung up on a gorilla falling out of a tree and becoming a man. Well, that's not where the theory of evolution begins. It begins, and honest evolutionists admit it, that it begins with the idea of non-life, whoops, giving forth life. It begins with a very false beginning. Well, here's a cute little article. It turns out in Scientific American, they discovered that there, there are little figurines. They have been called the Venus figurines. They go back about 400,000 years to the beginning of man's ability to manufacture things. They've always been pictured as naked figurines. 
Why? Because they could not possibly have been intelligent enough to manufacture the intricate clothing required to put on little figurines, little goddesses. Well, they've now discovered with the advanced technology that we have that these little figurines were originally clothed. You can see the weave pattern on the figurine. It also showed up in Archaeology magazine. A problem? Oh, that's just one problem. A group of Japanese archaeologists, another group of people that date back 400,000 years, were absolutely shocked to discover the high degree of, of, of tool working that was being accomplished, the complex tools and the, and the high degree of, of skills used by these 400,000 year old Stone Age Aborigines, if you will, who managed to make it to Japan. In fact, just to get to Japan, as they mentioned here, this was a New Scientist magazine, would require an incredible amount of skill and communication to go across the ocean to reach Japan. Two examples that are puzzling to evolutionists of how complicated and complex the lives of Stone Age people are. Why? It goes all back to that presupposition of Freddy the Frog becoming a princess. And that at some point in time, there had to be a lot of dumbness. Well, the Bible tells us that Adam was created smart. I think we're no smarter today than before. I'm going to give a few examples for you. This is a power saw. Right? This happens to be a handsaw. Which is the more complex tool? This is a more complicated tool. It has a bunch of things inside of it. You have to plug in this wire into a socket, into a circuit rather, into a plug. You have to have somebody generating electricity somewhere. And once you do that, you can saw wood. Took a lot of intelligence to design this. But the tool is just the tool, isn't it? Did the person that used this, was he any dumber than the person that uses this? I was raised at Fortune's Rocks, and I happen to be holding in my hand a saw that means a lot to me. This is my dad's saw. My dad and my papé, I'm Franco-American, half Franco-American, built that entire house, which now sits, it's a beautiful house, on the beach at Fortune's Rocks. It's across from the first pond, the second pond that you get to going this way, or the first pond coming up from Biddeford Pool. That entire house with this saw. Every board in that house was cut with this saw. Every finished board in that house was cut with this saw. And I watched them do it. The house is no less beautiful because it was built with this versus this. Intelligence is not necessarily related to the quality or the type of tools that you use, is it? This is a very basic tool. Jesus used a saw similar to this, except it didn't have the craftsman plastic handle. Hmm? One more example. I used to tutor chemistry when I was working for the Navy down at Trape Academy, and I was doing a talk, to a, not, not about creation, but just about things in general. And I would talk to the chemistry class year after year, just talking about how do you use chemistry in the Navy in real life and whatnot. One year I mentioned, any of you guys know what a slide rule is? And one kid said, yeah, my father took me to see one in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> this is a slide rule. As a matter of fact, it's my dad's slide rule. I have a much bigger one, more complicated one that I couldn't find. But I discovered this morning, <laughs> I've lost it, that I have a hard time remembering how to use this. But this little slide rule. I earned my Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering with, with a slide rule like this. I earned a Master of Science degree in Physics with a slide rule like this. I earned my, my Professional Engineer's License in the State of Maine, two eight-hour exams with a slide rule like this. We put people in space with slide rules like this. It was slide rule technology that put people in space, not computer technology. Most people aren't aware of that. Our original NASA rockets, the primary calculating tool, and I worked for the government for a long time as a research physicist, was a slide rule. One of the things I had to have when I went to work for the Binet Research Lab for the United States Army in their physics section, their materials section, was a portable pocket slide rule. Now, are the people that use this dumber? than the people that use computers? 
Or is it the other way around? I'm not talking about myself. What happens if you can't generate power? What happens if somebody blows up the transmission lines and all of a sudden we can't build a house, we can't make a hole, and we can't do a calculation? You can get logs on this. You can do anything with a slide rule. Oops. Assuming that it doesn't fall apart. Oh, yeah. this. The point of all this is, do you get the idea? We are always startled, puzzled, amazed. Come on in. We are always amazed when we discover that Stone Age people were able to build something. Well, ask yourself this, as intelligent as you think that you and I are, you may not think I'm intelligent, but as intelligent as you think that you are, I'll change that, what would you do if all of a sudden you were put into the middle of a, of a, of a wilderness somewhere and you had to develop the technology to turn brownish, rusty looking dirt into steel? Somebody did that thousands and thousands of years ago. You had to develop the technology to print or to weave or to manufacture things. Stone Age people are not dumber than us. Stone Age people had the same brain power that we have. In fact, it's quite clear if you're a biblical person that Adam is more intelligent than us. Freddie is not the source of man. An amphibian did not evolve into a human being all by itself, by chance. So you're not puzzled, I hope, when you read about Stone Age people that do great and marvelous things or that did marvelous things. You're not at all puzzled, I believe, I hope, by that because you understand that God created man ready to think, ready to operate, and that what has been going on, I do believe, by the way, in devolution or de-evolution, however you'd want to phrase it. I've never seen it written down anywhere. Everything that evolutionists in science, in, in the biological sciences, use as a proof of evolution is always a reduction. It's a decrease in information. It's never an increase in information. As Dr. Davies says, the physicist from, I forget where now, I quoted him a while back, can't remember where he's from, but he's a physicist, that there is no known law of physics that accounts for an increase of information by chance. Chance decreases information, doesn't increase. Mutations are a decrease in information. So do I believe in evolution? No, but I do believe in de-evolution. I honestly believe that we have lost and that we are, if anything, dumber than Adam and Eve were. So there you have it. Think about that. And whenever you read about these things in Scientific American and in New Scientist magazine over at UNE, for example, UNE is a great source. They've got a nice library. You can get New Scientist over there. You can get Science over there. When evolutionists are shocked at the incredible intelligence of these ancient peoples, you won't be because you know the rest of the story. They were made. They weren't evolved. Thank you. the response of reading. You're all reading your scriptures anyway. And I think this is such a big issue. Is it all over for the White Cliffs of Dover? Interesting. You see, th there's a presupposition with the idea of evolution that great time frames are required. Because of that, anything that looks like a rock will last forever, right? Because you remember, and I'll get my little prop. I keep Freddie up here. <laughs> Oh, Where, where's my rock in the... Oh, okay. Uh, Freddie, I think, is very popular with the young people. We had a five-day club here. But, but and, and I keep going over this, and I'm not... I think it's so important that you understand what the, the real concept of evolution is once upon a time, there was nothing. That's it. That's what the Big Bang means. There was nothing, and the nothing coalesced itself into an itsy-bitsy energy egg. I've learned this for years and years. I'm a physicist. And that energy egg exploded and made a rock. The rock in the presence of water 
rock is non-life, became Freddy, my little friend Freddy the amphibian. You see, the rock became life. That's the core of evolution. It's not did a gorilla fall out of a tree and evolve into a man. That's where they'd like you to have this, 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 your focus. The core is here. Can non-life become life? An honest evolutionist will say, no, we know that's impossible, but we can't believe the alternative, which is creation. Well, after this non-life became life, an even more miraculous thing happened, Freddy the Frog became a princess. Right? That's evolution in a nutshell. For that to happen, for a rock to become a frog, throw a rock in a bucket of water and watch it for a while. <laughs> you know, a lot of years will go by and you will not see that rock become a frog. Stir it. Right? So stir, <laughs> stir it, shock it, do whatever you want. That rock will always be a rock. Well, that's because you don't live long enough. Now, if you live to be 4.5 billion years old, perhaps you could see that rock become a frog. That's where the issue is. So, here is the, the issue now uh, with the white cliffs of Dover. They're disappearing. They just recently, I found out, and, and had to move a lighthouse because it was ready to fall into the sea. Well, there are little critters called limpets. They're like little seashells, and they live on the, the, the calcium deposits of the, the Dover rocks in England. And as it turns out, these little guys are eating the chalk, if you will. And they're eating it at the rate of 1.5 millimeters. You know, I, I have never been able to adapt to that. Whenever I got a book from England that was talking about something, I would always have to put little footnotes in. It, it's, I, I just couldn't relate to it, because I did all my research in terms of, of real numbers, you know, like inches, feet, and things like that. Well, that's a 1 16th of an inch a year. <laughs> that is far too fast. The engineers of England here in Brighton are absolutely astounded at the rapid rate that it's disappearing. At, at, in fact, at, at this rate, they, they figure in about 165 years there won't be any White Cliffs of Dover. Now, that's not a big deal. Oh, I suppose it is if you live on top of the White Cliffs of Dover. But uh, the fact that they're disappearing fast, what is that going to do with anything? Well, he caught everybody off guard. It's a big deal to them. It's a big deal to evolutionists because it doesn't fit the paradigm. Paradigm is a magic word. It's being used in business, it's being used in medicine, and it's been used in theology for a long time. That's your world view. That's the model you've used to put your world together. Everybody has a world view. Everybody has a paradigm. Everybody has a model, right, that you, you build your world on. The world is either built on the model of billions and billions of years by chance with no designing influence whatsoever or it's built on a very different model. If you build the model on God as creator, well then you don't need 4.5 billion years and you are now free to look at what science is really telling you. Hmm? You're not locked now by the change. You're not in bondage to the philosophy of evolution if you believe in just plain simple logic. Right? Just go outside and look at your car. You know that didn't happen by accident. Hmm? It was designed, it was built. Well, here's the problem. If you approach things as taking billions of years to happen, the White Cliffs of Dover, by every single scientist in the world, were assumed to be a very safe place to build things on top. Two villages have already fallen into the sea. What's the problem? They're dissolving much quicker than they thought. Why? Because they start with this paradigm, with this model of life, that incorporates in it billions and billions and billions of years. Somebody was telling me they went to the dentist recently and they watched a film on wisdom teeth. Millions and millions of years ago, you needed your wisdom teeth. Well, by the way, uh, about 50 years ago, I needed my wisdom teeth. My wisdom teeth came out as normal teeth. I used them for chew. I had them filled. My wife's wisdom teeth came out as normal teeth. She has a root canal on one of her wisdom teeth because it has an opposing tooth opposite it. They're not impacted, they're just plain there like they're supposed to be. Wisdom teeth are not a vestigial organ. And by the way, a vestigial organ has nothing, that means something you don't need anymore, right? Well, that's devolution, right? That's going down, it's not going up. That's the wrong direction. It's this paradigm that's so important. That's why I stress this so much. We include here in this church a strong faith in the Creator, Jesus Christ, who is also our Savior. And we're free because of that to reject the religions of evolution. By the way, evolutionists themselves recognize that evolution is the reason for the moral decline. 
And I alluded to that very quickly last week. If, right, an abortion is okay if what you have going through the, the, the development of the, of, your, of the baby in the mother's womb is simply a fish stage or an amphibian stage. See, then it's okay. It affects everything that we do. Rocks don't take millions of years to disappear. Rocks can disappear very quickly. The White Cliffs of Dover are an astounding statement to evolutionists that hold back. Maybe your paradigm is wrong. Maybe your model is wrong. Maybe things happen quicker than you think. Maybe England is not as old as they thought. That's the ultimate issue. England cannot be 400 million years old or 500 million years old or 4 billion years old. It must be only a few thousand years old because those cliffs wouldn't be there. Right? That's the issue. Think about it. Honor Jesus, your creator and your savior. Thank you. Gravity. What is it? I've mentioned quite a few times in the past that we really don't know what gravity is. No physicist or scientist or engineer, however you want to describe them, is capable of telling you exactly what gravity is. And there's a cute article in this newest issue of, of Creation Magazine about gravity. Some things about gravity that are kind of fascinating. I mentioned one time there, there are four fundamental forces in nature or in the science world. Something called the strong force, which is just the label that we give it, that holds nucleus together. You know, protons should blow themselves apart, but there are protons squished into the nucleus. That's a strong force, electromagnetic force, something called the weak force, and then gravity, which is thousands and thousands of times weaker than that. But is gravity a force? Nobody really knows what gravity is. What causes the attraction between masses? Hmm? What is it that makes one mass attract another? Is it a transfer of a particle, a subatomic, subatomic particle called a graviton? Some scientists think so. They've also talked about strings, cosmic strings, cosmic waves, some kind of a wave energy, if there is such a thing anyway. So what kind of force is gravity? And how could gravity, whatever it is, evolve slowly? Gravity had to be in place at the very beginning. Could not possibly evolve slowly. Life wouldn't exist without gravity. You couldn't walk without gravity. We all know the movies where, where way back in 2001 when it first came out. I was in grad school when 2001 came out. And if you remember Hal, the computer that uh, unhooked all the people and killed everybody? Well, when they walked around in the ship, they were just floating like, right? Well, not only that, gravity is what causes friction. Without gravity, there'd be no friction. Friction is a, is, is a re function of force or weight, which is caused by gravity. So you couldn't stop your vehicle. As you pulled into the parking lot here, you smash right into the church. So gravity could not possibly have evolved slowly. But then there's another issue. Is gravity a force at all? And Einstein thought it wasn't. Einstein does not divine define gravity as a force, but a curvature of space. He calls it an actual curvature of space. So scientists don't even know if gravity is a force. We don't even know what it is. We do know it affects time. We understand that. And we know it affects weight, because you weigh a lot more on the Earth than you would on the Moon. But what's interesting about gravity is it's totally, absolutely, 100% essential you couldn't survive on this planet without it. The oceans wouldn't stay where they are without it. The tides are a function of gravity as well as rotation. But without gravity, nothing would stay on this earth. You could not have developed a system like this without gravity. How in the world could something so complex as gravity possibly evolve by chance? One further thing. There is a, a formula that uh, scientists play with. It's, it's uh, called the attraction force between two masses. It's the result of a product of the masses themselves divided by a square of the distance apart they are. A square, as she could tell you, it's, it's been measured to 2.0000000. It's exactly two. If gravity had arisen by chance, why wouldn't it be 1.97 or 2.16? If it was 1.97, we'd all die. 
Isn't it interesting that it's an exact, even function, the force attraction between two objects? Very, very fascinating, isn't it? Something like this could not possibly have evolved by accident. That's two points I want to make this morning. One is gravity very obviously is essential to you. It's, it is something that you could not survive without. It is something that not a single organism on this earth could have evolved if there was such a thing as evolution without. So it had to be in place instantly. It did not develop slowly. That's point number one. The very fact that you're able to walk on a floor is testimony to your creator. Point number two is, you think scientists know everything, don't you? Especially now when they come up with the genome mapping and all that kind of stuff. There's an article in that, w that hit the newsstand recently, I guess it was Newsweek, that this should put an end to all creationist talk. Why? The genome mapping proves intelligence. And as Dr. Paul Davies, who's an atheist, says, there's no known law of physics that will add intelligence by itself, by random. The second point is, scientists do not know what you think they know. And you can get a PhD in physics and still believe that gravity is a force until you start playing with Einstein's relativity and you discover Einstein didn't see gravity as a force, but a curvature of space. What is gravity? No one has a clue. Nobody really knows. I have a master's in physics. I worked all my life as a research physicist. Nobody has any idea what gravity is, what causes it. All we know is what it does. Very clearly, gravity was put here by your creator. It could not evolve slowly. From day one, gravity has been here, and although science doesn't understand what gravity is, God does. And in fact, the scripture tells us that in Jesus Christ, all things consist, all things are held together. So I'm gonna say, for lack of any scientific evidence to the contrary, gravity is God's holding together his world. Thank you, think about it, thank you. That's probably the reason. That's probably the reason. It was good singing. Anyway, this planet is a unique planet. It's very, very different. Uh, this one, I, th this particular creation moment comes out of the Sunday Telegram from, I think it was last week's. I'm not sure. I buy my newspaper two or three days late. Uh, uh, believe it or not, I'm not sure I should say this publicly, but uh, I'm pretty cheap. You know that you can get the, the Sunday Telegram for 25 cents? on the Monday after Sunday at Shaw's. So for 25 cents, I get my Sunday newspaper a day late. And by the way, the news is just as depressing Monday as it was Sunday. I mean, they've discovered some new planets. In fact, there's a meeting going on someplace in Europe, and, and they're talking, England as a matter of fact, and they're talking about this, these 50, 10 more planets rather, that now makes a total of 50. So we now have roughly 50 planets. And what is surprising, in fact, I'll quote now. When you read articles like this, you need to, to read between the lines and start to think about what's really being said here. The unexpected, this unexpected trend is continuing. What unexpected trend? That not one of the solar systems seen or observed supposedly resembles our own solar system. In this article, they go on to say that the... Uh, the Earth is unique. You know, well, at risk of sounding sarcastic, well, duh. I mean, <laughs> the Earth is very unique. And, and the other thing is that the planets, when they actually do discover a planet, astronomers cannot see a planet. Anybody know how they can tell that there's another planet out there? They look for the sun wobbling back and forth. Exactly. They look, uh, uh, Priscilla, can you come up here? I want to, what they look for is the wobble. <laughs> The wobble of stars. Now, now, you, you, can't, you stand up behind here. You'll see why I've got my wife doing this in a second. And now, now, stand right behind me. Okay? Now, stand still. I'm going to wobble you. <laughs> now, you see, she's moving, but you can't see me, I hope. <laughs> Now, wh why is she moving? That's what they look for. They look for a wobble, and you know that I'm back there pushing her. 
the assumption is that the wobble in the star is caused by the gravitational attraction, we talked about gravity last week, right, of the planet that is rotating or in orbit around that star or that sun. Every star is a sun, it's a bag of gas generating light, right? And in fact, is that really so? Uh, Harvard University has just uh, a number of people that work on this and they have ruled out alternative explanations such as violent fluctuations in the star itself. Well, maybe they have, uh, maybe they haven't. The best scientists in the world just a couple hundred years ago thought that the sun orbited the earth. So what is it that causes the wobble, number one? Is it really the gravitational attraction of a planet? You don't really know. When they say that they have seen a planet, you don't really read between the lines. Read with a critical mind. They don't see a planet. They see the effect of the planet. You saw my wife wobbling up there. Now that could have been because I was pushing on her, or it could have been because she had a couple of glasses of bourbon before she got here. <laughs> Not likely. <laughs> So you don't really know. That's point number one. When you read an article like this, read what they're really saying. And so far, as it says here, neither, they're talking about very, the, the, the various patterns of these, these orbits. And even if this star did have this planet rotating around it, the orbit is wrong. The, the orbit so far, that everything they found, other than in the solar system, has a, a, a very bizarre orbit, very different from ours. None of the patents ever discovered so far look anything like the pattern of Earth. They were, the, the orbits are much too close to the sun, or much too far away, so you would burn and fry, and then what didn't fry would freeze. Earth is unique, and they quote this, and they call it unusual. They call it unexpected. Now stop to think about that word when you read an article like this. Why would that be unexpected? There is an underlying thought process here. It is unexpected because underneath all of this stuff, there is the thought process that everything happened by accident. If life evolved in this solar system, then it must have evolved in another solar system. That's the thought press process underneath this. That's why it's unexpected. So keep those things in mind when you see things like this. Number one, after spending billions of dollars, and as Dr. Hoven says in our, in our video, NASA's money is funded from your tax dollar. After spending billions of dollars in searching through the outer space, if you will, coming up with a variety of assumptions, all they have concluded so far is Earth is unique. All they've come to the conclusion of so far is there is no place like Earth for life. No other place so far has been seen that could maintain life as Earth does. Now think about that for a minute. Isn't there a better way to spend some of those billions of dollars? Hmm? At any rate, Earth is unique. Secular scientists, evolutionary scientists have, have proven this over and over, much to their chagrin. It is unexpected to them, and when you read articles in the paper, stop to think about why do they say it's unexpected. And then also include things like this. Remember, as you read these things, gee, they really don't see a planet, do they? They see the effect of the planet on the star, supposedly. And there's so much question about it that physicists at Harvard have had to spend even millions of more dollars to prove that it really is caused by a planet and not by burping within the star. But they don't really know. They really don't know. And scientists change their mind by the day. I worked for 31 years as a physicist. I changed my mind by the hour. We really don't know. The Earth is unique, and it's unique because it was created by God to be unique. Keep that in the back of your mind. Nothing, nothing will startle you if you... If, if, the, the fact that Earth is unique is not startling to you. Nothing will surprise you that science discovers. Absolutely nothing, because science has never discovered anything to contradict what you already know from Scripture and already know in your heart. The Earth is unique. God created life. He created the solar system. He put the stars in place. He put the Earth here. He put the air around it. He put the sun and the moon up. It's unique, manufactured by God, created by God 
for his good pleasure. Thank you. Now, don't, don't get depressed now. Those of you that have had biology, we're not going to get carried away. This is the classification system developed by Linnaeus. It's used in biology now. There are other parts to it. The, the, the phylum is, has subphylums and subclasses and suborders and whatnot. But what, what's the point of this? Well, in the very bottom line, the ability to breed species, people will make fun of you as a Christian, if you tell them that you believe, for example, that God saved all of the animals on Noah's Ark, why? Because they equate species with kind. And in fact, Linnaeus, who developed the system in the first place, thought that kind was species, the ability to interbreed. Well, is it? First off, the ark is huge anyway. It's the size of either 517 or 522 railroad cars, depending on how you calculate the cubit. It's huge. But nonetheless, is species the same as kind? Can a lion mate with a tiger? If you are a biology teacher, you would say no. In fact, I shared this with a biology teacher that said, really? Hmm. There is a guy named Samson. He's a male. This is a picture of Samson. Samson's father is a lion named Arthur and a tiger named Ayla. Samson is huge. He can run at 50 miles an hour. Hard to believe, isn't it? Look at the size of that guy. That's a man standing behind him, a six-foot-tall man standing behind him. Samson, in addition to being able to run 50 miles an hour, weighs something in the neighborhood of four or 500 pounds. He is a monstrous animal. He is a liger, and that's an official title. What is remarkable about, remarkable about Samson is that Samson is the result of two different species mating. He is, by normal biological definition, impossible. Tigers do not mate with lions. The problem is, in the wild, lions and tigers are natural enemies. Because of that, biologists have cooked up a classification system that probably isn't really, well, here's proof, isn't that accurate. They're natural enemies in the wild. So they never get a chance to mate. So nobody knows. So they identify them as two separate species. Well, it turns out that Arthur, the lion, and Ayla, the tigress, became friends in a zoo in Florida. And because they were friends, they were able to mate, and they produced Samson. Samson is huge. He is a result of two different species. So, species then are not what is meant by kind, obviously, in the book of Genesis, is it? This one is harder to see, but it's much more miraculous. This is a wolfen. This is the product of a whale, a killer whale, and a dolphin. Now, killer whales and dolphins are natural enemies. They cannot mate. They are not just two separate species. Wait till you hear this. If, if you're a biologist, they're two separate genera. They don't even belong to the same genus. Well, a father killer whale and a mother dolphin mated and produced a wolfen. And the wolfen's name, it's kind of cute here, I probably have a hard time pronouncing it. Kikemalu is the wolfen's name. She lives in Hawaii. Well, here's the kicker. She had a baby. She mated with a dolphin. So what is the biblical kind? Is it species? No. Is it genus? Who knows? Could even be family. What I'm trying to point out to you here, here's a couple of examples that you can find. In fact, there's a website if you're interested, you see me afterwards, you can go read about on the, on the internet, read, read about Camellia, whatever her name is, the, the wolfen. 
Now, zonkeys and zosses. A zonkey is a, is a zebra and a donkey, and a zoss is a zebra and a horse. And yes, they have made it, although they are of different species. Many, many examples of different species being able to mate and produce offspring. And the most miraculous of all, and the most unsettling to biologists, is the wolfen the whale and the dolphin, because they come from a higher order, from two different genera. So there you have it. Just because you read something in a biology book, just because you read something in National Geographic, just because biology teachers have been teaching you for years and years and years that two, two different species cannot intermate, does not mean that it's true. It does not mean that it's true. And when somebody laughs at you as a Christian because you say, well, I believe that Noah saved all of the animals, had all the animals on the ark, brought there by God. And somebody says, well, that's ridiculous. You can't have that many species on one big boat. You say, wait a minute. Two points. It's a big, 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 big boat, number one. Number two, what makes you think that a species is the kind of, that is identified in Genesis? As it turns out, it is not. It is not the kind. Species is not the kind. Miraculous things. In fact, I've been asked to find this information in some magazine other than Creation Magazine so this biology teacher can take it to school and show it in, in the classroom because this magazine would not be acceptable in the public school magazine. This is Creation Ex Nihilo and therefore, of course, tainted. You have to instead go to something that's far less reliable and uh, use that in the public classroom. But there you have it, the reason for this stuff up here. Don't panic about that. If you took biology, you have to memorize this. The whole point of this is to identify to you that the kind in the book of Genesis, and they, re they reproduced after their own kind, does not mean species. So lions and tigers all came from a particular kind. Obviously. Thank you. Of the evolutionary principle is the survival of the fittest. And in fact, we were watching a video this morning with Dr. Ken Hoven that stressed that quite a bit. Evolution is the reason for racism. Racism comes out of the evolution teaching. In fact, if you will take the trouble to read Charles Darwin's book, Origin of Species, it's in the MacArthur Library, it's in the Dyer Library, it's at the University of New England Library, it's all over. Go through the book. Charles Darwin himself identifies his race, which happens to be Anglo-Saxon type, as being far superior to the natives that he found on his infamous voyage on the Beagle. In fact, as uh, Dr. Hoven mentioned, and I was going to mention this this morning anyhow, Adolf Hitler was a racist. In 1936, at the Olympics, which we're about to, to celebrate again, a very unusual thing happened, a very disastrous thing happened for Adolf Hitler. And that's just before I was born. I can't tell you about 1936. You have to talk to some other people sitting here to find out about 1936. But I do remember reading about it, Jesse Owens, destroyed Adolf Hitler's theory. He destroyed what he was trying to, to do, trying to say. Jesse Owens won a large number of gold medals, beating the superior Aryan race. And in fact, today, I found out for the first time, Dr. Hoven, who visited Kent State College in New Hampshire and went through their library, found a listing put together by Adolf Hitler. Why did he kill the Jews? Well, he found a listing of the hierarchy of evolution that Adolf Hitler used. And at the very bottom of the list were the Jews. And he identified them as mostly ape. Right above them were the African Americans or blacks as almost mostly apes. So there you have it. Racism is a birth product of evolutionary teaching. Now, you haven't got to take my word for it. And you can go, by the way, and read a much newer book. A guy named Stephen Jay Gould, who is today's most famous evolutionist, has written a book called The Panda's Thumb. It's available in the MacArthur Library. It's available in the Dyer Library. Probably available at UNE. I don't know. Stephen Jay Gould is very, very famous. He's an evolutionist. He's a biologist. Anybody that studies biology in high school and beyond will be familiar with the name of Stephen Jay Gould. In this book, he clearly identifies the racist attitude that comes out of evolution, although he himself is not a racist. Well, what is the whole idea of this, this, this 
survival of the fittest. Well, it means that the reason you are where you are is because you tromped on something else to get there. It's a very unbiblical philosophy. It's a philosophy that has no root in science. And in fact, I'm going to talk about that this morning. Badgers, and the title of this cute little article is Nanny's Badger Evolutionist. Well, it turns out in the badger group, there are badger nannies. There are badger ladies who do not have husbands, hmm, just like in, in people, I guess. And these badger nannies actually help the badgers that have children raise their children. It would have been nice when we had six children. I know some in this church that I had many more than that. It would have been nice to have a nanny helping us do that. What's the problem? Blows the theory apart. Evolutionists have to struggle to explain this. You see, why would you bother to feed a, na a badger that did nothing but help other badgers take care of children they already had? It doesn't make evolutionary sense. So evolution has to come up with the concept, well, well, maybe then, maybe in, in this battle for food, that these are really helping because they're freeing the mothers up. No, 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 they found out that's not true at all. These badger nannies actually do eat up more food than they earn. So why are they doing it? What does this do with the idea of the survival of the fittest? Well, it kind of throws the theory of the survival of the fittest out the window because that theory doesn't survive because it's not fit. These animals do take care of each other. And the badgers do feed the nannies for nothing more than just allowing them to hang around and help raise the kids. And they are eating more food than they're worth. Offhand, that's not a big deal, is it? But do you realize what's going on in the battle with the evolution teaching? The battle that's going on here is that this, this isn't possible. You have, well, you've evolved from a rock. You know, one time, nothing became a little energy egg and over a term of a, a couple microseconds or less blew up into a rock. And over a period of time, the rock became Fred, my little frog up here, the amphibian, and Fred, the amphibian, became a princess, right? Without being kissed by the prince. That's the whole idea. And to get there, you had to be superior. Whoever is at the top of the food chain has to be superior. That's the idea behind evolutionary teaching. It's called survival of the fittest. It is the root core of the Origin of Species book. Read the book. It's available anywhere. It'll disgust you. Then read some of the writings of Hitler. Read Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf is a very well-known book. Hmm? Read Stalin. Stalin was an evolutionist, and he credits evolutionary theory. He credits it to his behavior. We must get rid of the inferior people so that we can have a superior people. Racism comes from evolution, and the reason that in this church I spend so much time talking about evolution is ra not just racism, but anti-God philosophy springboards from evolution. We stand on the scripture in this church, and the scripture is very clear. God created people. God created critters, created them the way he wanted them created. The idea of the survival of the fittest doesn't hold water, and the theory doesn't hold water. And every once in a while, I read a cute little article like this that blows holes in that. And I, I talked once a few years ago about meerkats. Meerkats do the same kind of thing. Think about it, and think about the Bible. Thank you.